This is the Marketing Podcast Network. Want Instagrammers and YouTubers to mention your brand? Or do you want to influence an audience to buy your product? I'm Jason Falls, author of the book Winfluence, reframing influencer marketing to ignite your brand. In this podcast, we explore the people, companies, campaigns, and stories that illustrate the difference between using influencers and actually influencing. Welcome to Winfluence, the influence marketing podcast. Hello again, friends. Thanks for listening to Winfluence, the Influence Marketing Podcast. We are now in 2022 and are within 12 to 24 months of a cookie-less world. Google announced in February of last year that sometime in 2023, it will no longer support third-party cookies for behavior tracking of its browser users. Safari and Firefox had already headed down that road, so it was rather inevitable. But that poses a significant challenge for brands as advertising targeting and retargeting has often been tied to third-party tracking of browser usage. We are entering a cookie-less world. David Tentner is the man behind a company that says it has the brand's toolbox for thriving in the world without cookies. The company is called Thought Leaders. It leverages the long form and social content and audiences of influencers to help brands target using better triggers for content and context. He loves building media plans for companies that include ad spend on deeply contextual long-form content like podcasts. So we hit it off nicely, as you might imagine. We're going to dive in with David today to find out his take on how brands can better target audiences without cookies, perhaps more effectively than they did with them. Before we get to that, I want to share another case study and story about how one brand uses Tagger. It's our presenting sponsor and a complete influencer marketing software suite that allows you to find, connect, and collaborate with influencers, execute campaigns, and measure success. I recently caught up with Alexandra Walsh at 3-Day Blinds. They provide consulting and products in the premium custom window treatments category. We chatted recently about how she uses Tagger. So when you got in there and started, you know, using it for the first month or so, were there any features that you stumbled upon that maybe surprised you? The best thing that we've experienced so far with Tagger is the team. They are so responsive and there to help us. If I have a question and it's the end of the day, they answer any day, any time. Like they're just always there to help. They'll hop on a call with you. They'll go on a Zoom meeting. They really just try and help you because they want you to have the best experience. Thanks to Alexandra and 3-Day Blinds for sharing their use of Tagger. To learn more and get a demo to see if Tagger is right for you, just visit jason.online slash Tagger today. That's jason.online slash Tagger. What will we ever do without cookies? Apparently, target and deliver more effective ads. David Tentner of Thought Leaders is next on Winfluence. David, your your work lies at the crossroads of my two favorite uh, subjects, influencers and podcasting. So tell me a little bit about Thought Leaders and what you do. Well, Thought Leaders, we have a pretty clear mission of trying to give brands the tools they need to not need cookies anymore. We want to um, allow brands and thus the people who are producing really good content to reach their audience without needing to track people around the internet, do behavioral targeting and all that privacy infringing bad stuff. Um, And our whole kind of hypothesis is that we can do that if we really understand content, especially long form content really well. So that's why we work with influencers or content creators. And we really care about podcasts because we think podcasts are one of the most influential mediums out there. It's long form. And as you know yourself, um, you can build up an awesome audience through it that really cares about what you have to say. So out of curiosity, and, and I have a podcast network for marketing podcasts casts that we should talk about offline, but um, how, how do you kind of produce those, those ad buys? Are you buying them through like Spotify audience network or other similar networks? And what happens if a podcast I identify that I want to be associated with maybe isn't one of those, or is it, is it less granular than that? Okay. So, so we, I thought that as we built a, a platform with a lot of technology, 
where brands are using it both self-serve and they're also coming to us to do media buys like you're talking about and essentially um, either do one-off media buys or do an agency program where it's managed service with a budget. We're working with, depending on the brand, sometimes it's um, creators that we are actually representing them directly. And other times it's like you're talking about, we're going to podcast networks or one-off creators and um, reaching out to them for the first time. With podcasts specifically, we do work with a bunch of networks, um, but we really, really like working directly with the creator. Um, It just kind of like if we have our choice, that's usually the way we go. Um, because then we can build a relationship, not really for us so much, but for them and the brand and get really close to them to make sure that the brand that we want to promote is actually a perfect fit for them and their audience. And it's not just that it's a perfect fit that we think it is, but that the, the host or the creator actually thinks so as well. And will thus talk about the brand in a natural and native way to their audience. It has to really come off as an endorsement and not um, a you know pause my normal my normal content now. Let me go away to something that you don't care about for thirty seconds, and then I'll come back in. It has to feel natural. Um, so we do work with networks a, a lot, but we, if possible, we like to work directly with the creators. Well, and I'd like to think that, and, and obviously, I probably need to give you a, a debrief on Marketing Podcast Network before I get any deeper into this. But I like to think that we're sort of splitting the the difference there because with uh, with the collection of marketing, you know, topic specific podcasts, we have the network advertising availability, but we also have the availability and possibility to go in and sort of customize everything per show if we need to. And so, um, you know, we're trying to kind of split the difference between you want to reach marketers on behalf of one of your clients. Um, and we have, let's say right now we have nine shows. Eventually we're going to have a lot more, I hope, cause it's just, it's new. Um, but once we get to the point where we've got 20 or 30 shows, now you've got a very concentrated, hyper-targeted topical audience that you can reach instead of having to go one off to, you know, 30 or 40 different shows, you've got a better path. So that's kind of what I'm, what I'm trying to build there. So we'll, we'll talk about that, uh, off, off the, off the show. I wonder though, what do you say to someone especially on the brand side, uh, or do you ever have to say this? Who, who, someone who says to you, no one listens to podcast ads, everyone skips them. So it's a waste of money. Talk me off the ledge if I'm that guy. <laughs> well, I, I mean, that would just be wrong. Um, <laughs> I would, I would, I would probably, uh, you know, have to hold my breath for a second and, um, and, uh, you know, think about how to respond, uh, calmly as, uh, it's, it's just not true. And, um, we know that from experience, a lot of experience where, um, I mean, it just, we did an internal kind of poll throughout our company recently of who had bought what from a podcast. And the list was ridiculous. <laughs> every, every, you know, brand that you've heard of Manscaped, the Rev Towns, Athletic Greens, um, better help, right? I mean, these are all brands that are just going really, really hard for podcast advertising. And um, even within our small sample size of our company, it was like, oh yeah, I bought this, I bought that. Oh, I got a discount from from this creator. Um, we also know from directly working with our brands that they're seeing really, really high return on ad spend from their podcast campaigns. Um, so I think the there the real challenge that you kind of touch on here is that it's podcast advertising spend is increasing rapidly, but the technology for attribution and um, reporting on the effectiveness of the advertising spend is not increasing at the same rate. It, it is getting better and there are tools out there that are starting to um, offer some solutions for being able to prove that people are listening to podcast ads and people are buying and converting from um, the ads that they hear. But it's still kind of the wild west out there when it comes to podcast uh, reporting. And uh, that's something I think we're going to see drastically improved over the next year or two. Well, and I, I'm glad that companies like yours are trying to close that gap because you're right. They're reporting on podcasts is, you know, despite the fact that podcasts have been around a long time and these players and the technology have, uh, the analytics and the metrics are, are often very frustrating to try to track down. 
uh, you know, a download is, is a download, but does it mean someone listens? Not necessarily. So there's ways to get into that, but they need to get a lot better. By the way, um, the, the statistics that I've, the most recent statistics that I've found for those who are listening, who might be uh, interested, 71% of listeners never rarely or only sometimes skip podcast advertisements. So you're looking at, you know, less than, than 30% of people ignore them. 71% are actually listening to them. They're paying attention to them. Um, there are 86% of podcast advertisements have, they have the highest recall of any digital advertising medium. So people remember the podcast advertisement better than they do in other mediums. And then 76% of listeners report taking an action after hearing a podcast advertisement. And I mean, I'm, I'm right there with you and the people in your company. Um, I have literally turned and recommended and this yesterday, by the way, I turned and recommended bowl and branch sheets to two friends of mine um, who were talking about getting new sheets. And I said, well, I don't have bowl and branch sheets, but they advertise on every podcast on the planet, I think. So you might want to try them. They, they sound pretty good. And the next time I'm in the market for sheets, I'm probably going to go try some bowl and branch because I've heard so much about them. So for those of you who might be skeptical, there you go. You bring up a good point there. I think that uh, today, you know, in the end of 2021, if you're a brand that's seriously thinking about how you're going to market yourself, it's the question of, um, it's not a question anymore if people are listening to podcast ads or not. I mean, they are, but even if you don't want to believe it, podcast has become such a force of a medium that you have to be on it. It's just something you have to do. Um, in the past, you know, you, you had or I have to be on Facebook. I have to be doing search. I have to be doing YouTube. Um, now, podcast is just another thing you have to be doing. And I don't think anyone's going to sit here and say, stop everything else you're doing, replace everything with just podcast. That, that's not really the point. The point is that this is a place where there is real influence and real um, loyalty to the creators that are speaking about the brands on their episodes. So, I mean, you have to be here. It's, it's not something that maybe five years ago we could have been debating like, uh, it's not for me just yet, but that, that's not the debate anymore. This is, this is something that you have to be doing in addition to some of those other major things that you have to be doing as well. That's very true. Do, I wonder from your perspective, um, I think I know the answer to this, but I don't want to make assumptions here. Um, and I've thought about this from a technical perspective of communicating a message via short, you know, audio, 30 second, 60 second audio. Are there brands out there that aren't a good fit for podcast advertising? Well, I think the most obvious thing that might be difficult for a brand is when it's really, really visual. So at Thought Leaders, we do a lot of work on, on YouTube as well. And sometimes we have brands that are doing great on YouTube and want to, you know, give podcasts a try and don't find as much success. Uh, it's rare that we find a brand that would be like, that isn't able to do podcast at all. Right. But they're, but it might be that they're not really able to ramp up their spend like crazy on, on podcast because not everything's working for them. Um, so if the nature of the product is something like really, really visual, that could be difficult. Um, I think the most, I guess, obvious other thing is the funnel itself, because if you're if you're tracking your your marketing um, effectiveness really closely, and you should be as a brand, and you're trying to test, um, let's say, different landing pages or different um, vanity URLs, different discount codes, and that's kind of like your only method for um, the attribution of podcasting. Um, there are, as we mentioned, some other tools out there, but let's say that's like the tried and true method today. And if your funnel isn't really tight, you might not find that you have the same forgiveness as some other mediums might have. Um, because there, there isn't like, let's say, uh, comparing it to YouTube, there isn't like a link right below the video that the creator can say, click here, you know? Um, <laughs> true. So those are two things that come to mind that might make um, it more difficult for brands. The visual one, uh, that, that's challenging. That's really up to the product. The funnel one is something that's totally fixable. I mean, you should get your funnel tight and you should be tracking it. And if it's not tight today, like you have a lot of benefits, not just making podcast work for you, but a lot of other benefits that will come by making your funnel tight. 
Nice. So let's talk a little bit about finding those relevant long form content creators. That's got to be a significant challenge too. I mean, there are podcast directories of sorts with all the various podcast providers. There's also pod chaser and pod chaser pro, which I love and use every day. But every time I go to a different platform and enter a search term, I get dozens of podcasts I haven't seen yet. How much is out there that no one's really seen? Tons. Absolutely tons. Uh, Thought leaders right now, we are tracking over a hundred thousand podcasts, which which is not anywhere near what's what's the the full number is constantly growing. The last I heard was something like four million, three million of which are active, something like this. Um, for us, when we say tracking, it means we're actually transcribing every episode. Um, so we're tracking over a hundred thousand now, which is, which again is just a fraction of really what's out there, and we're constantly coming up with, um, as you mentioned, brand new channels that were like, this is amazing content. I've never even heard of this before. Um, What's really interesting about podcast as well, I think even more so than YouTube and some other uh, content formats is that feels like the, the, um, a a great strategy for brands is often to, to really get into these more obscure podcasts, Um, niche podcasts, really spread out what they're doing. I think that's because across these niche podcasts, they can get really good pricing for their sponsorships. And that makes them um, get obviously a better return on their their ad spend. So it's all about kind of using these discovery mechanisms to find the new thing, the unexplored territory that no brand has been in before. That's great. I've, and, and, and if there's any brands out there, by the way, who think the influencer marketing is an area you want to tackle, give me a call. No, I'm kidding. Cool. Um, so I think another thing that really strikes me as, uh, the, as we talk about the confluence of influencers and podcasts, I've always referred to podcasters as a type of influencer, but I think they're also seen as sort of separate types of content creators. I don't think a lot of people think of podcasters in the same vein as social media influencers. However, I think there's starting to be a shift to the Instagrammers and TikTok stars realizing they need to own more uh, of their than than just their content. They also need to own their own channels, which infers blogs and podcasts and email newsletters, et cetera. Are social media influencers beginning to start podcasts and such these days? Are you seeing that shift? I definitely think that people are recognizing they when they're building an audience, they they should be on more than one content format. Um, I mean, there's just people that consume content in different ways and you're not going to, you're not ever going to capture everyone through one single method. Just it, it's a utility thing, a functionality thing. Um, when I drive to work, I'm spending an hour in traffic. I listen to a podcast. Why? Cause it wouldn't make much sense to watch YouTube during that time. You know, uh, it wouldn't make much sense to scroll through my Instagram during that time. I'm in the car, I'm driving, there's an hour of dead space podcast is absolutely perfect for it. Uh, I think, so you kind of, you call them social media influencers and I'm not in, in my head, I totally don't know if this is how the rest of the world sees it, but in my head and kind of the way we built thought leaders was I always kind of drew the line around kind of different worlds in short form versus long form content, because the way I saw long form content was it, um, it needed to be much more planned, um, orchestrated, um, like you and I doing this podcast interview, you know, we, we scheduled a meeting a while in advance. Now we're, we're sitting, we're recording it. Then you're going to go back. You're going to edit it, right? Then you're going to launch it. It's a different process. It doesn't make it better or worse than, than, um, short form, but it's a totally different process and mindset than I'm, I'm going to tweet something right now, or I'm going to put something on my Instagram or my TikTok. And that's kind of how I always split the word, the world. So for me, in long form content, it was things like uh, blogs, newsletters, YouTube, podcasts. Um, again, the line is really gray because then you start throwing things in like live streaming. We could be doing this live interview on Twitch or on Clubhouse, and then you could you know, take the recording and turn it into a podcast and also put it up on YouTube. So what I think is also happening is content creators are realizing that they can be, they need to be on multiple formats because that's just how people are consuming content. And they should also be maximizing their, their effort, especially in long form, because making long form content is difficult. 
So if I can get the same, um, I guess, subject matter into three, four or five different content formats while recording one interview, like that's a, that's a win. That's a huge um, bonus with, with my time. We're seeing a lot of, um, of YouTube simulcasts for podcasts as well. That's an area that I see is really starting to grow. And I heard a stat recently that YouTube is actually now the largest podcast player in terms of um, listens or, or views or impressions, just because YouTube itself is so massive and a portion of it is people doing podcasts on it. Um, so definitely think that people are going to be on more formats. Well, I, I always look to uh, when I'm trying to figure out the stats and the data of consumer behavior and, and, and audio, uh, I always look to Tom Webster at Edison Research and, you know, they do the infinite dial uh, every year. And it's a, you know, primarily a podcast audio, audio streaming, um, you know, survey of at least the American population. And he actually wrote in his email newsletter last week. That if you say you can you know, get your podcast everywhere you listen to podcasts and you're not simulcasting it or streaming it on YouTube, adding it to YouTube later, then you're not really available everywhere because so many people listen to podcasts on YouTube. In fact, this very show, because of that email newsletter, I started, you know, outputting a you know waveform video for Winfluence and putting it up on YouTube because I thought, man, if, if the guy who knows the research says I need to be there, then I need to be there. So you're, you're absolutely right that... Uh, uh, that YouTube is a great place for people to consume that. I hope to, to see my numbers tick up because I'm there now. So for the influencers out there, especially those shorter form social media influencers who are considering other channels to basically expand their content footprint, um, give them sort of the reality of monetization of podcasts, especially through advertising. I think most new podcasts are typically started around a niche topic, but the key to advertising you know, monetization is the M's as in thousands of downloads, CPMs, and niche doesn't really serve those numbers very well, unless you've got a network of like-minded shows like the Marketing Podcast Network. But so how much can a podcaster who starts a show about something relatively obscure or laser focused, how much can they expect to make realistically and or what methods should they use to try to monetize that channel? That's a really good question because you you basically hit the nail on the head that if you have a niche podcast, what's not really fair is that you might have an outsized influence over your small audience, but not get the large download numbers that you know a CPM based pricing model would would get you a fair a fair amount of money for an advertisement. So um, I actually had this problem myself. Um, uh, a few years ago, I was running the Hacking UI podcast and the Hacking UI network, and it was a, a niche podcast for designers and front-end web developers with an outsized influence, I would like to think, over that community, but it was a relatively small community compared to, you know, if we're selling things on, on a CPM basis, we're getting a few thousand downloads per episode, right? And it took a lot of effort, a lot of work. And you're like, come on, man, this is not that much money for, you know, it wasn't covering costs even if we were to sell it on a CPM basis. What I would say to niche um, uh, content creators is that um, that's not the way to go. It, what the, the best thing to think about is to work backwards from what value the brand is getting out of your ad. And, and you're not going to be able to sell at least consistently above at a price point that is more than the value that a brand is getting back from your ad. So let's start with that. Like sometimes content creators um, think that they're worth something or their ad is worth something. And um, it's unfortunate, but, but they're just, they're just not, that does happen. Um, but if you work backwards from the value that a brand is going to get from your ad, then you could start thinking about pricing it more um, accordingly. So for example, if I have a software product that I'm willing to pay, uh, $200 per, per um, free signup, right? Um, and you can drive, you know, 10 signups, then in theory, you're driving $2,000 worth of value to that brand. Um, at the end of the day, you're going to have to be able to deliver that value 
Um, I'm not suggesting that you that you price based on affiliate. I'm, I'm definitely not suggesting that. I don't I don't like that pricing model personally. Um, but I'm just saying that for a long term relationship between a creator and a brand, you're going to have to be able to deliver that kind of value for them. Um, now, that especially if you're working on promoting products that have high CPAs, high um, cost per acquisition that they're willing that the brand is willing to pay, then that works really well for a creator who has a smaller audience, but maybe an outsized influence over them. Um, there are a lot of software products out there that are willing to pay a lot of money for an acquisition because the the subscription model they work on is I need to bring in one user. That user gives you know signs up for an annual plan, and they add seven seats, and pretty quickly you know that's worth five thousand dollars, ten thousand dollars a year to my company. So. Um, that is going to be probably a much better way to go for a niche um, podcast than shooting for brands that are only willing to pay a couple bucks per per uh, acquisition. Let's say like a free app or um, a very cheap um, direct to consumer product. Um, that that's going to be difficult for you to drive enough sales for them, um, just because your audience is not that large. So you want to look for products where you can drive a few sales. But each of those sales is worth a lot of money. And then you could charge more to the brands for it. Very good. Very good thoughts. And and for the influencers out there that are thinking about expanding into these longer form uh, content platforms, because it's it's a lot of work. And early on, it's probably not going to be a lot of revenue. But of course, if you're leveraging several different channels and several different ways of connecting with brands, it can make a lot of sense for you. So uh, if I'm a brand that wants to get in on these influencers and their podcasts, how do I do that with thought leaders? Well, uh, we have a platform that lets you discover um, and essentially look through podcasts to find which ones are relevant for you. Um, you can go through YouTube, through podcasts, through email newsletters, through blogs, essentially long form content, see which brands are sponsoring there, uh, which is a great strategy because then you could see which brands are essentially sponsoring there continuously, which means they're finding success and ideally reduce your risk when you're buying um, a new um, podcast sponsorship because you know that it's working out for other brands. You can also do the reverse and you can see which podcasts are not getting any sponsors. And then you can know that those are probably priced a bit cheaper and, and you know maybe try those out as well. Um, on top of that platform, we also do managed services. We have a, um, a, an internal program where we take um, budgets and, and run these um, podcast campaigns or YouTube campaigns for brands that don't want to do it internally. And where do they pay, uh, where do they find you on the interwebs? We are at thoughtleaders.io, uh, or you can follow us on on Twitter, on LinkedIn. Uh, we have a very funny LinkedIn page and very cool LinkedIn page, if I do say so myself. Lots of good memes coming out each week, especially memes about the death of the cookie. So if you are into a <laughs> um, combination of like uh, dad jokes meets uh, marketing, um, we're the place to be. <laughs> You probably just got, you tripled your follower count by listening or <laughs> telling that to my audience. So that's great. David Tentner, great stuff. Uh, let's be sure to talk offline about MPN, but uh, we might find a way to work together there. But I appreciate your time today. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot for having me. It's been fun. Winfluence, the Influence Marketing Podcast is presented by my book, Winfluence, Reframing Influencer Marketing to Ignite Your Brand. Get your copy online at winfluencebook.com. While you're there, sign up for the latest ideas about influence marketing delivered in my monthly newsletter or book me to speak to your company or organization about influence marketing. If you or someone you know is an influencer, a brand manager that uses influence marketing, or one of the many amazing people working in the influence marketing services world, and they would make a good guest for the show, email me at jason at jasonfalls.com. Our theme music is One More Look by the K Club and Grammy Award winning producer Jaquire King. Thanks for listening, and remember, when it's not about the person, but about results, it's Winfluence.